Well, you may be seated this morning. So welcome to the gathering. We are so glad that uh, you could join us this morning. Uh, my name is Matt Treemstra, and it's my uh, privilege to share with you today, and I'm really looking forward to it. As Peter already mentioned, we've put a new uh, lead pastor in place. So there's that handsome devil right there. Um, and we are very excited. Um, it was a shock to, to lose our lead and founding pastor. But God has been in the center of it all. And he has been, been in the center of our journey. And uh, we are so excited for Chris and what he's doing. And we are excited for Jeff uh, and what he's doing. Uh, but Jeff isn't here yet. So, you're not here yet. You have to listen to me for a little bit longer. So, I'm happy to share with you today. Isn't it fun with transitions? Um, so, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, currently involved in kind of government relations uh, and politics. That's kind of what I do when I'm not moonlighting uh, as a preacher. Uh, my wife was the worship pastor there as well, and you'll see my three kids, Jonah, Bell, and Audrey, uh, running around. And so I'm excited to, uh, to dust off my degree and share with you today. Um, I do officially have a degree in intercultural religious studies from Trinity Western University, which is a Christian university in BC. It's really just a fancy way of saying about communicating the gospel across cultural differences. If you're curious as to why I did that degree, but I'm in politics, that's a whole other conversation for another time. Happy to have that chat with you if you want to come and find me. Um, but for now, um, I've been part of this church uh, since year one, and it's just been an incredible privilege to be part of the journey, uh, to see it grow, to see it transition, and to see it grow in such a healthy way. Uh, I'm also a board member here, and uh, I've preached several times, and uh, I'm looking forward to doing so again today. Before I start in service, I just want to follow up on Watoto, and uh, what an amazing group of kids those were. We were so excited that they could be here. I didn't think that I would walk away so encouraged that I kind of thought, you know, we're going to hear about uh, your plight in Africa and be educated. Uh, I didn't suspect that I would walk away as encouraged as I did uh, to hear the joy. And at least two of those songs were sang last week. Because of your generosity, we raised $4,500 for Watona Ministries. So thank you. Um, and that doesn't include uh, sponsorship or any of the merchandising uh, that you all bought as Christmas gifts. Uh, so we are incredibly blessed by your generosity. It was great to see uh, the back door open and the community come. And uh, we had over 255 people come. And so what a great event. So I just wanted to say thank you very much for that. So here's my message. We're going to be talking about selfie, living an examined life. So first of all, thank you to all of you who uh, let me take your picture. And uh, here's the final product. And uh, I'm grateful, even though you didn't know what I was using them for, that I got to put them in, uh, in this kind of screenshot. So my basic premise is this, is in a digital age where society is obsessed with taking photos, taking selfies of themselves to post on social media sites, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Tumblr, on Pinterest, that do we ever actually take the time? We see our picture all the time. We post it. We, all, we always look good in our pictures. It's always key moments that we post for the world to share. But do we ever actually take the time to evaluate our own lives, our own selves? And are we looking for Christ living in us? If we've accepted Christ, he's living in us. And there should be evidence of that. It should be there. And I worry that we live in a culture where we, we present these photos to the world, but we don't do any of our own self-reflection. And so we'll be looking at, over the next, this week and the next three weeks, about how we find God and how we ensure that our faith is genuine. And we'll be asking tough questions, like in, in the busyness of your life, are you taking the time that you need to reflect to look into God, to listen to him on areas that perhaps you need to change. And I'm not sure we do. I'm not sure we spend enough time on that. So we need to start with some basics first. So what the heck is a selfie? For a certain generation of you, this is a commonplace word. Uh, for some of you, when I took your selfies, uh, like Wayne, that was probably his first selfie ever. Is that your first selfie, Wayne? Not quite, not quite okay. Um, you know, but for many, you might not even know what a selfie is. I mean, the basic definition is, is when you take your smartphone like this, you take a picture of yourself, um, kind of on your smartphone, and yes, BlackBerry still counts as a smartphone, and uh, you post it online. 
uh, and for social media and whether it's Facebook or Twitter uh, or whatnot. I mean, that's kind of what a selfie is. In fact, last year, Oxford Dictionaries uh, released their kind of word of the year and selfie was the international word of the year for the year 2013. Uh, they actually conducted research into the English language and they found that the word selfie, the frequency, had increased by 17,000% from the previous year. So Oxford Dictionary labeled this word the international word of the year and you know we're, we're, just, we're obsessed with these, with taking these photos of ourselves. So you know there are a lot of famous selfies out there in the world. Uh, I particularly love this one. Yes, this is the Pope. Like, this is the Pope of the Catholic Church. He is in a selfie. He's at the Vatican with a bunch of youth. Uh, They are gleefully calling this the first papal selfie ever. So if the Pope can take selfies, you know, I'm sure that we can as well. Um, So this just, it makes me laugh uh, that even the Pope is taking selfies. So what are some other ones that are out there? Well, here's two, uh, here's two gems. So we've got one on, on, uh, on my left here, and that's uh, President Barack Obama of the United States. This is Nelson Mandela's funeral, by the way, and uh, he's in the audience. And uh, that's the De- uh, Denmark's Prime Minister and uh, British Prime Minister David Cameron uh, taking a selfie. And uh, there's a lot of controversy about whether, whether or not uh, uh, Michelle Obama is glaring at them because of what they're doing or maybe doesn't even know. I'll let the body language decide for itself. Uh, But there's a famous selfie. This other one is incredible. Uh, This other one, right in the middle there, is Ellen DeGeneres. And she's, of course, a talk show host. She hosted the Oscars. And uh, she went into the audience and took this selfie. I don't think I've ever seen so many famous people in one selfie before. In there, you've got uh, Bradley Cooper, Jennifer Lawrence, Julia Roberts, even Brad Pitt, Meryl Streep, and Kevin Spacey in the back. Uh, Ellen took this picture posted it to Twitter, and it has been seen by 37 million people worldwide. 37 million people have seen this selfie. Uh, So it's incredible. So we live in a culture that is obsessed with taking pictures, kind of at our best moments, and posting them online for the world to see. Now, I need to be clear. I have nothing against selfies. I think they're fun. I, I, I hope you don't leave here thinking, well, I can never take another selfie again. I mean, even I take selfies. So... I took a lot of, of ridicule for this one by a lot of my friends who made fun of me of posting a selfie in my barbecue. I was just really excited to get this barbecue. And if, I should have shown you the old picture of my old barbecue. Um, but I was really excited. I took a selfie. I shared it. I have nothing against selfies. And uh, I am just using it as a point to illustrate that we spend so much time taking pictures of ourselves, posting them online for the world to see, that I am fearful that we don't take enough time to look at ourselves, to truly look at who we are in Christ and what we can do to improve our lives, what we can do to examine our lives. Socrates, uh, the famous philosopher, is thought to have said that the unexamined life is simply not worth living. So how do we examine our lives in this digital age, in this busy life? How do we examine our lives? And that's really kind of the premise of what we're going to be sharing about as, as we go forward. So what is the problem with self. And uh, we're going to start by reading uh, from the message. So up on your screen, you've got Romans 8. And please feel free to follow along with me. So that's 7 to 8. But I'm going to go a bit further back, and I'm going to read a couple of verses here, because I think they're relevant. Uh, this is from the message version, uh, which of course is a, as, as a paraphrase of scripture. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a legitimate um, uh, translation. It's a paraphrase, but I think it's helpful. And especially for this verse, I really like the language that speaks to us in our modern culture. So starting in verse 5, it says, Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle, but never get around to exercising in it in real life. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's spirit is in them, living and breathing God. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us into open, into a spacious, free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ignores who God is and what he is doing, and God isn't pleased at being ignored. The verse continues and it says, But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. 
But for you who welcome him in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's term. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the live and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive as to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be alive as Christ. So the section that I've got up there, it says, you know, that when we focus on ourselves, we stop focusing on God, and that God isn't pleased at being ignored. Uh, the second fact is something I really want to, uh, to, to draw on, and it says that if God has taken up residence in your life, that if you have invited him to share in this journey, if he has come, if you've accepted his sacrifice, if he is in your life, then there should be evidence of that, that you should be an outpouring of his spirit, that you should be able to think about him, and that their evidence is there. So the question remains is I don't think any of us deliberately think, oh, you know, God of the universe, I'm just going to ignore you and I'm going to focus on myself. It's not really that conscious of a decision. So how do we examine our lives to ensure that it stays true, to ensure that we stay focused and to examine our lives and where our faith is? I think, the, unfortunately, the only way to do that is to start testing ourselves. Um, and so I really think that a test has to be the cure. And, um, you know, we do tests all the time. I mean, I think you were hoping that after university or high school, you never have to write another test. Um, but we do tests all the time. We do driver's tests. We do blood tests. We do heart tests. We do all this kind of stuff. And so I think that the only way we can do it is to uh, go through another test. And so this brings us then to the core scripture that we're going to be talking about. Uh, for this message particularly, but for the whole series as well. So it's simply this. It's 2 Corinthians 13, 5 to 6. And it says, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Um, I particularly like how the message phrases it as well. So this is the same verse. I'm going to read it again. So there's a different slant, different language that really resonated with me. Test yourself to make sure you are solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourself regular checkups. You need first-hand evidence, not mere hearsay, that Christ Jesus is in you. Test it out. If you fail the test, do something about it. So I think it's pretty clear um, from this scripture and others that we need to regularly test our faith, that we need to ensure that, in fact, Christ is living in us, and that in order to remain focused on God and not on ourselves, that we need to test ourselves uh, to ensure that we're focusing on God. And again, I don't think that we deliberately think to ourselves, okay, great, God of the universe, get it. You created the whole universe. You created the specific orbits, the specific orbit of earth that allows it to maintain life. You created us. You built us from dust. You know everything in my life. I get all that, but I'm just going to ignore you and kind of do my own thing. I don't think any of us truly think that. But it happens, and it happens over time, and it, it's drift. It's, we're drifting. Uh, I love this imagery of the waves and the ocean. Growing up, uh, my family and I would hop into our minivan, and we would caravan with eight other minivans, uh, all pulling trailers, and we would go camping, and we'd go to kind of Maine or Virginia. And uh, our idea of, uh, of this kind of trip would be to set up a, in a campground, be at the beach for 8 a.m., you know, set up an umbrella city, um, have snacks, and not leave till 5 or 6 p.m. I mean, that was, that was our uh, day of fun. So we loved playing in the ocean. We had boogie boards. We loved to surf. We loved to do all that kind of stuff. So we would go into the water. We would play to our heart's content. But at some point, we'd get hungry, and we'd realize, hey, we want a snack. And so we'd look up. We'd get out of the water, and yet we couldn't find our base camp. We couldn't find our umbrellas, you know? And, you know, you panic for a second. You think, well, where am I? And the currents had been pushing you along as you've been playing. So all that time, all the hours you're in the water, the current kept on pushing you so that when you got out, you didn't recognize where you were. And so that's drift. It just happens. We don't set out to get apart from God, but over time, we just start to drift away. And there could be a lot of different reasons that you're drifting from God. Uh, you could be blaming God for unhappy circumstances in your life. You could be hanging out with the wrong crowd who are not uh, building life into you that's causing you to drift from God. You could be just falling into temptation. You could just be too busy 
and that you just start to naturally drift from God. There's a verse in Hebrews 2 that says this. It says, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. And so if we're not focused on where our original camp was on the beach, if we're not focused on God, if we're not taking time out of our lives to examine ourselves, we run the risk of just drifting away and not recognizing where we end up. So that's the problem, and I think we want to talk about the solution. How do we prevent drift in our spiritual lives? How do we remain focused on him? And so I think first and foremost, we have to recognize that as human beings, we just kind of suck. Um, and that we need God's help. And so I love this verse in Psalm 26. It says, Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind, for I have always been mindful of your unfailing love and have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. So this is a verse straight from Scripture. It's King David saying, Test me, God. Try me. Examine my heart. So as a starting point for our discussion today, I think we need to say that. I think we need to say to God, I cannot do this on my own. I need your help. We need to do this together. Please test me. Try me. Examine my heart. I have been faithful and mindful of your unfailing love, but I want it to be true. I want it to show in my life. So test me. So I think as a starting point before we do any of this else, that we can't examine our lives independently. Uh, we can't just examine our lives and, and just see a counselor. We need to invite God in. We need to say, God, test me and try me. Which, frankly, can be a scary thought. Um, but I think we need to do it anyway. But if we do this, if we ask God to test us, frankly, we need to, we need to make time for that test to occur. Um, we lead busy lives. And if we don't make time to be tested, you know, we run the risk of this whole point being moot. We live in such a crazy society, uh, one that relentlessly pushes for more, buy more, do more, spend more, rush, 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 more, 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 more productivity. I think it's a reality that most of us work more than 40 hours a week, uh, that our evenings are crammed with activities for the kids, activities for us, sports, music lessons, you know, and then we go to home church and we go to church on Sundays. Even our meals are rushed. I mean, for how many of you has the happy meal, you know, become the default meal for your family? Because we're rushed. Uh, even our kids are getting overwhelmed these days with their school, their homework, you know, and their activities. We rush. And I, if I could magically give you an extra two hours in your day, I'd love to. And I'm sure you would say to me, if, Matt, if I had two extra hours in my day, I would spend it reading scripture. You know, I would spend more time with my kids. I'd get extra sleep. And those are all noble, except I fear that if, if we did extend our days from 24 to 26, you'd just absorb it and you'd just be as busy. So the answer is not more time. The answer is using our time more wisely. And I love this verse in 2 Peter 1.3. It says this, it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So everything we need for a godly life. I would propose that based on the scriptures we've read, that examining our lives, that testing ourselves um, would contribute to living a godly life. And so since that's the case, God is going to give us everything we need to do that. And that means that he can redeem our time. That means that he can redeem how we use our hours and minutes. And we need to take that time. And I really hope that in home churches this week or in conversations, you can have discussions with people about what it looks like for them to creatively use their time to reflect and with God. I don't have a magic bullet. I can tell you to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning. I can tell you to do a whole bunch of things, but you need to make time for God. So what does that look like in your schedule? For me, I try to spend time with God and in prayer on the bus. I spend 45 minutes getting to work. More often than not, I'm sleeping, uh, but occasionally when I'm not sleeping, you know, I try to have my Bible, I try to pray. You know, and that's just kind of one creative way that I do. And I really want us to learn from one another. You know, how do you make time for God in your life? For some of you, it might be giving up an activity. For some of you, you may just realize, wow, we've got three to seven activities during the week, something needs to go. For some of you, it might be as simple as waking up 15 minutes early but we need to make time to be tested by God. So we, we've talked about this idea of inviting God in. So God, test me, try me, know my heart. We're going to make time for the test. But what the heck is the test? I mean, when you're studying, you want to study. Okay, I've got a math test. It's on chapters one through four. That's what I'm going to study. 
and boom, 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 and you get ready for the test. The verse in 2 Corinthians that says to test your faith, it's in my mind, when in my reading, is not prescriptive. It doesn't say, and the test shall be one, two, three, four, five, and if you fail six, you're doubly in trouble. I mean, it doesn't say that. It doesn't give you a prescriptive list of tests. But what it does say is that you have to examine ourselves to look for God in your life. Is there evidence of God in your life? I would think that there are a multitude of ways that you could test for God in your life. Um, frankly, that's the purpose of the scripture, of the Bible. There's so many things you could do to test for God in your life. So I've chosen to pick three. So there are three relationships in our life, which are core to us as a church as well, that I think that we need to look for evidence of Jesus being in our life, of being true to our faith. So we've got relationships with God, we've got relationships with others, with our friends, and we've got relationships with our church. And so this is uh, what we're going for. So let's look at these three areas how we can examine our faith in light of these three areas, and questions we can ask ourselves as we move forward. So your relationship with God. How do you measure your relationship with God? When I look at my faith, when I take this uh, verse from 2 Corinthians seriously, examine my faith, I want to know where am I at with God? Um, what can I look? What can I measure? If, there, if God is in my life, there's going to be evidence of that. So what does that look like as reflected in my relationship with God? For many of us, you know, we accept the gospel, we accept Jesus, and there's a lot of benefits to being a Christian. Joy, peace, he can save your marriage. There's the, the promise of heaven. There are so many benefits. And yet when the rubber hits the road and there are challenges, are you enjoying a committed relationship to him? And, you know, the question is, is how committed are we to God? Um, the inverse of that is how committed is, is God to us. And he was so committed that he gave this ultimate sacrifice. John 3.16, perhaps the most quoted uh, verse in the Bible. You see it, you know, for everywhere from, from t-shirts to, uh, you know, in dark paint under football players' eyes. I mean, it's there. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's an amazing verse, and I, for one, wonder if I've heard it quoted so many times that it started being meaningless, that I don't let it sink into my life. Uh, is it true in your life? Do you spend time reflecting on this sacrifice? So as we look at examining our relationship with God as a starting point, I think there are some questions that we can ask, and so kind of questions to ponder. And I think one of them for me is you f spend time reflecting on the cross, about what it means. And I don't just mean, uh, you know, once every three months when we do communion corporately or once a month when we do communion in our home church. I mean, those are all important times to reflect on the cross and what it means. But in your day-to-day -day life, are you spending time reflecting on the cross? A follow-up to that would be, are you making your own decisions with regard to whether God's will or your will is at play? And so I think if we think of ourselves as being committed to Christ, if we examine our lives, these are just two starting points to kick us off about how do we examine where we are with God. There are so many more. Are you reading your Bible? The sheer amount of Bible resources available in this day and age is insane. There's literally no format you cannot read the Bible in. It is at our fingertips, but are we reading it? Are we praying? Are we praying regularly? I would just say that if we profess to be believers in Christ, that that evidence should be there in our relationship with God. And we need to take the time to examine if some of these things are on track. Like I said, so many more we could look at, so many more we could point at. But for our relationship with God, as we walk away from this message, as we go back to our homes and we make time examining our lives, are you focusing on a sacrifice? Are you in his word? Are you praying? Just as a starting point. Uh, the next part of the slide here is uh, our relationship with others, with our friends. And uh, this picture is from my favorite sitcom, How I Met Your Mother. And it uh, just symbolizes to me a group of friends uh, and what it means to, to have friends. And I think before we accept Christ, we live, we live for ourselves. We live a self-centered existence. Uh, but when we are saved, we're also transformed by the power of God. And the self-centeredness that we have is replaced with a humility and a love for others. And so I think that somebody who professes to believe in Christ is going to hold this verse to be true from Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, humility value others above yourself. 
I truly hope that when I sit down and I examine my life, I can say, yes, you know, I value others above myself. I value my friends. I value what I'm doing. And that a believer with evidence of Christ in their life, if you look at this area, they will put others above themselves. So are you passing this test or are you failing this test? Um, And this means so much to God, this uh, putting others above ourselves, this humility. I mean, God, Jesus goes on to say uh, later that um, if somebody has offended you and you go to the altar and you remember that they've offended you, to actually stop what you're doing, to go back, to reconcile with your friends before you can go to God. I mean, that's how important it is. And so if you are living a life devoted to Christ, one of the evidence of that is going to be how you treat others. Do you put them above yourself? And so some questions to ponder as you go home this week are, are you placing your interests uh, above others? Are you making decisions uh, with no consideration for how others will be affected? Is there un- unresolved conflict in your life with other people? Again, just a starting point. But I would put forward that if you're living a life devoted to Christ, that you would be valuing others more than yourselves. And so as one example of a checkup, uh, that Second Corinthians says we should go through. Look at this area of your life. When you think about your others, other people in your life, are you putting their interests ahead of your own? The last area that I want to touch on is your relationship with church. And um, we all come to church. We, we've come here. We engage in worship. You know, we are the church. Whether we are in a building um, or we are a people, um, we are here to worship God, to fellowship together, to ultimately reach unsaved people, to reach those who don't know uh, Christ already. And so why is it important for us to be committed to the church? I think, again, we go back to um, Jesus' sacrifice, was for us, was for the church. And uh, I love this verse that talks about the power of the church. So it's in Matthew 16, and it says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. There is power when we get together as a group, when we get together to fellowship, when we get together to worship, there's so much power that the gates of hell will not overcome it. This is the power of our church. And I think that if we live a life that is committed to Christ, the evidence there is going to be, are we as committed to the church? And so some questions for you to think about is, are you fully in life, involved in the life of this church? Are you and your family reaping the benefits that come as a result of being committed to the church of God? Or do you show up and leave right away? Or do you show up, get the information, get the free snacks, and leave? Or do you contribute? And this is not uh, a follow-up to Peter's cry for uh, volunteers. That's not, that's not what we're talking about here, but are you committed? If God is saying you can be more committed and one way you can show that is by volunteering your time, great. But are you committed? And that is, looks so many different ways. Do you come expecting to meet with people? Do you come expecting to fellowship, to challenge one another, to pray for one another, to have coffee with somebody new, to leave and go have lunch with somebody else? Are you committed to the life of the church? And if you are feeling challenged to get more involved, we'd be happy to have you. But if you're being challenged to meet somebody new or have a cup of coffee, that's also great. And again, if you are a believer, I think that one area that we can test in our life is our commitment to the church. And so as you walk away from this place— what areas uh, in the church could you be more committed to? Uh, could you be more and fully involved in? And maybe it's as simple as you're not inviting enough people to come out. It could be anything. But I just think it's important that we evaluate, test, and examine our relationship with our church. So that's it um, for those three relationships. And so I just, what I want you to walk away with is this. Is that focusing on ourself is the opposite of focusing on God. So test yourself to make sure you are solid in the faith. We live in a culture where they love taking selfies, where we post pictures online, and there's so much focus on self, uh, superficially. But I would say that we need to challenge ourselves to go more in-depth than a selfie, to go more in-depth to truly examine what it is in our life that makes our faith solid, that makes it strong, to be not afraid to examine the areas that we're in. I think I've given you a lot of information this morning, and frankly, I recognize that I may not have been practical 
uh, that I may not have given you three things to do at home. And, you know, we try to do that, and yet I'm left with, these are just questions that you need to ask yourself. And so I think a lot of this needs to be worked out at home. Um, if this is your house, I apologize. I just Googled houses in Riverside South. Um, it, but you need to walk this out at home. You need to examine your life, and you need to do it at home. You need to do it in home church. You need to do it with friends. Really quickly, from the top, this is what we discussed, that we want to live genuine lives for Christ. We want to not be selfish. We want to focus on him. That first and foremost, we have to invite God to test us, to test us, to try us, to examine our lives. That that first and foremost has to be there, that we need to involve God in it. That we need to make time for that test. That God will give us whatever we need for a holy and godly life. And that could involve redeeming how you spend your time. And the third one being that you need to test your relationships with God, others, and your church. Again, just three that I picked. There are so many different areas that we can test. We're going to go in more detail in the weeks to come. But as a starting point, these three relationships, which are integral, I think, to the life of a believer, are you testing them? Are you testing your relationship with God? Are you regularly in contact with him? Are you praying? Are you putting others above yourself? Are you committed to the life of the church? These are just three starting points that I think that you can think of. Only you know how busy you are. Only you know how much time you have in your life to have these conversations with God. Only you know about the state of your relationship with God, with the church. Only you know how to carve time out of your life to have these conversations. But I would challenge us to remember what 2 Corinthians says, that God does not want to be ignored. And that focus on ourself is taking away focus from God. We want to test ourselves to make sure our faith is genuine. And it is a test that I want to pass. A test that I desperately want to pass. That I want my faith, that Christ living in me would be reflected in my actions. So I want to test myself to make sure it's genuine. I don't want to drift away from God. I don't want to enter the water and end up a kilometer away and not even realize it happened. I want to remain focused and centered on him so that I don't drift. Or that when I do drift, I get back quickly and I have friends who can support me through that. I want to focus on God. I don't want to drift. I want to lead an examined life. Let's pray. Dearly Father, you are amazing. You are more than amazing. God, if we have accepted you into our life, then the fruit of that should be evident. God, and I desperately want to live a life that reflects that you live inside of me. God, it is my heart's cry that I could live a life devoted to you, that people would know it. God, and I take seriously these words in Scripture that say to test ourselves, to know that our faith is genuine. And whatever those tests look like, and there are so many more, God, that you would come into our lives, that we would ask you to help us, to test us, to examine us, that we would lay bare our hearts. And God, that might be a struggle for some of us. Some of us might be thinking, I don't want to have my heart examined. God, I know I'm going to fail. But God, you are with us every step of the way. God, and you don't want us to fail, and you will be there. And God, as we look at these three relationships, God, with you, with our friends, with our church, God, that they can be a fantastic foundation, that if Christ is evidence in us through those three relationships, that we can build. But that as a foundation, God, you are there. So give us the strength to ask you for help. Give us the strength to examine ourselves. And God, in the quietness of this moment and in our weeks to come, May you point out things in our life that we can examine, that we can improve, and that we'd have a willing heart to be receptive to that. In your name we pray. Amen. That's it. Selfie number one is done. Two, three, and four are coming up. We're looking forward to it. I'm going to be in the next couple of weeks, again, all around this theme, but how God views you and not how the, girl, uh, how the world views you. And uh, we're going to be continuing to build, and I am looking forward to doing that. Of course, we don't spare the questions uh, for guest speakers. So my lovely assistant Peter here is going to uh, walk around with the mic. So I was going to say what he said. <laughs> <laughs> this is what he normally does, so that's why... Uh, one second here, we got a question from him. So those of you that are visiting again today, this is something we do every... Uh, Basically every Sunday, uh, we hand the mic around for any questions on the topic of today. 
Matthew, I really liked your sermon. I've got, I'm just going to be straight up and honest with you. You know, like when I'm by myself and there's somebody in need and I go up to them, I like walk with Jesus. Like I would never hurt uh, a child or, you know, like if a person is Down syndrome, I would treat that person with respect and stuff like that. And I think that's walking with Jesus. Mm -hmm. My next question is, I, I'm strong with Jesus, but then when I'm in a situation where I see somebody and they're being mean to something, I hesitate before I say, you're a jerk. <laughs> and then people have backlash, right? And then I get scared. So sometimes I don't know what to do in that situation because I have a little bit of self-preservation and if there's a whole group of people, mm -hmm. and then I get mad at myself, and then I get mad at Jesus. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's, that's a complicated question. Um, at the end of the day, you know, if, if Christ is living in you, um, I really think that we need to be discerning when we approach situations and that prayer, first and foremost, needs to be there. Um, you know, that as, as we encounter situations, confrontations, that we, we know we go walking with Jesus, you know, but we can invite Jesus into every situation and say, how, how do I react in this? And there may be some cases in which um, he knows abundantly more than we do and how the situation is going to unfold. And there may be some, some situations in which he says to be silent and there be some situations in which he asks you to stand out. But I think prayer has to be the beginning of that conversation. That as you approach these situations, I, I don't have a perfect answer for you. Every situation can be different. But if we're living an examined life and God is with us, then prayer is a part of that. And I think we just need to approach each of these situations remembering to pray, not reacting to situations and then thinking, oh, you know what, I should have prayed, you know, and asked for direction. So I think as a starting point, that's at least a good tool uh, to help you as you approach situations. Hi, Matt. I just wanted to thank you uh, because I was feeling kind of overwhelmed. And then you said you're going to be spending the next few weeks because really I was like, how am I going to do this? <laughs> How do I do those three mm -hmm. steps? And I just look forward to, to hearing what you have to say. Yeah, and, and I recognize that. I recognize that it wasn't uh, an easy, you know, take, take this, take the blue pill kind of thing. Um, you know, that we have to work it out. This was really an introduction to the whole topic. And I hope that you take some of those questions that are listed in your bulletin, but begin the conversation. You are not going to change overnight. And if you're sitting here with a heavy heart thinking, dude, I just failed all of those tests, and every single one of those questions I failed, I mean, that's okay. We are all broken people. I fail some of them too. Do you know? And so we are all broken. I think, though, that if we want to live, examine lives, we have to start somewhere. And we have to build. And God will be there every step of the way for us. Okay, so I have a, a comment and a question. The comment is, quite often when I um, feel, I test myself, I come out at the end and saying, oh yeah, I'm such a great person. But then I have very close friends who, when I tell them that, oh, I test myself and I came out great, 100%, and they're like, oh, I don't know, Ryan, what about this area in your life or this area in your life? It's like, oh, well, that hurts. But I'm very thankful for those friends. Mm -hmm. I think this, uh, the selfie sometimes, maybe someone else needs to hold the smartphone for me. Yeah. Uh, to get those blemishes on the left side of the face. But, um, and my question is, the, about the idea of a test, it seems like when Paul is talking about it, it's, um, the result comes out as either, uh, you know, yay or nay. The mm -hmm. result is Jesus is in you or Jesus is not in you. And I'm, my question is, in what ways is it uh, a continuum or is that not the right way to think about it? Does that question make sense? Right, it's not as black and white, you know, yeah. it's, it's just part, partly in you in these areas, but not in these other areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, we need friends, absolutely. I think that's a great point. Um, you know, maybe I'll do a whole ser a sermon series on people taking selfies of you. Um, you know, but as iron sharpens iron, so we are called to sharpen one another. And I think that's absolutely a, a positive way to move forward from this. And I think, you know, that second relationship was with others. I mean, if we are valuing others over ourselves, if we build that foundation, we're going to build friendships, you know, that can speak into our life. So I wholeheartedly agree that uh, just because we examine ourselves, um, you know, perhaps our view of ourselves is, is more rosy than it should. Um, but I agree as well. You're right. Paul said, 
uh, look for God in you, and if he's not, then you fail the test. Um, you know, these tests are not, it doesn't say you fail the test and you don't enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, it's not a, it's not a black and white, shoot, if you didn't value, you know, others more than yourself, you know, you've now failed, sorry, the gates of heaven are closed. I don't think it says that, you know, but I think it's saying that, that we have to look, that we have to have these conversations on an ongoing basis. So I don't think it's black and white. You know, there may be two of these relationships where you thought, yeah, I've got these, but one that you can work on. We are all works in progress. We will always be works in progress. None of us is perfect, and on the day we reach heaven, we won't be perfect. So I think you're right. Um, continuum and evolution, but a, an ongoing discussion. Uh, that's not black and white. Hey, Matt. Uh, great job today. Uh, can you say again your thoughts and, and uh, the, the portion where you, you said you've got to reconcile with others before you reconcile with, with God? Mm -hmm. I just want to explore that a little further, if you could. So the, the value here, right? So we talked about this, this value in Philippians. Um, that do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value others about yourselves. Because that was kind of the starting point. Um, the verse is Matthew 5, 23 to 24. Uh, let me read it kind of directly. So it says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. So I, I take that to mean then that if we want to try and have a connection with God, if, if we're praying, if, if we're seeking God for something, but if there is unresolved conflict in our lives uh, with another person, that God is basically saying, like, go deal with that, you know, and then come back to me. Um, that that relationship is important to him and can actually block our ability uh, to talk to God. And so I think that that's it. It's this, uh, this idea that before we can connect with God, that we've got to be uh, confirmed or good with our, the relationships of those around us. Um, and I think it's brother and sister. Um, I think, and now I'm getting into just shaky ground, uh, but whether or not that's a believer. I think if I have an issue with you, Jason, as a believer, and, and we're fighting about something, that that can impede my access to God. Um, now, if I have a relationship with my boss at work who's not a believer, I think there are likely different standards, um, but ultimately, you know, God wouldn't want me to seek out um, and, uh, and calm down conflicts. Uh, but that's kind of my, my initial read of that. Does that kind of answer your question? Was there a question on this side earlier? I thought I saw a hand. I forget who put it up. Any other questions for Matthew this morning? Sparked a few there, Matt. Well done. Sweet. We're looking forward to the next few weeks. Thank you. I trust uh, you've been challenged this morning as well, and uh, you'll get to take uh, what Matt shared and uh, digest it a little. And speaking of digestion, we're going to have lunch right now. How's, how's that for a segue? <laughs>